Hey everyone, today I'm bringing you a preview of a member exclusive lecture from my membership website on a very heavily requested topic, which is going to be multi tenancy in a Nest.js application, which we're going to use Drizzle ORM to implement in a very clean and scalable way. We're going to use async local storage and be able to actually create new tenant connections inside of our application dynamically at runtime simply by providing a tenants JSON configuration file, which is going to allow us to provide tenants with separate database connections. And our application will connect to all of these tenants at startup, execute any migrations as needed, and then we'll actually have the ability to provide a tenant ID header to our application to retrieve tenant specific data, which is completely isolated inside of separate databases thanks to this multi-tenant architecture using Drizzle ORM. So simply by swapping out our tenant ID header, we can retrieve separate tenant data. Finally, we're going to be using async local storage from Node.js to implement our multi-tenancy in a scalable way, which is going to allow us to implement a form of thread-safe local storage in our Nest.js application. Now this new lecture is available on my membership website, which I'll leave a link to in the description. So if you sign up, you get access to the full video, which is about an hour and 15 minutes long and includes a complete end-to-end -end solution for multi-tenancy in a Nest.js application using Drizzle ORM and async local storage following best practices. So again, if you'd like to check this full video out, I'll leave a link to my site in the description below. So I'm super excited to get started with this lecture. We're going to cover so much. And by the end of it, you'll be able to implement multi-tenancy in your web applications. Thanks so much for watching and let's jump right in. All right. So to go ahead and get started, let's initialize our application by using the Nest.js CLI. If you don't have the Nest CLI, you can of course make sure you install it with npm install g for global at Nest.js slash CLI at latest version. So with the Nest CLI installed, let's go ahead and create our new application. So we'll run Nest new, and I'll call this Nest.js multi-tenancy. And I'll use pnpm as my package manager. So this is going to go ahead and initialize our project and install all of our dependencies. So with our application created, I'll cd into our application folder, and I'll open it up in a code editor. So now we're looking at the default Nest.js application. We have all of our starting files. Importantly, we have the main.ts inside of the source directory, which is calling our bootstrap function, which as we know is creating our Nest.js application by providing the app module and exposing traffic on our HTTP server here on port 3000 by calling app.listen. So this Nest factory is creating our application using our root app module. So this is our root app module that is providing a single app service and a single app controller. Decorated with app controller decorator is exposing our HTTP traffic. And in here, we're simply exposing one get route using the get decorator. And in here, we're using this app service that we've injected. So if we look at the app service, we can see we have it here with the at injectable decorator, which means we can inject it into other providers. And we have our get hello method here, which is simply returning some stub string. So let's go ahead and test our server out to start. We should be able to start our development server up using pnpm start colon dev to start up our server in development mode. So it'll recompile with any changes. So the server is starting up. I'll also go ahead and open up Postman and let's launch a get request now at the server localhost 3000. And we can see we have a 200 status code with that hello world stub string. So our application is initialized properly and we're ready to start implementing multi-tenancy. So we're going to be using Drizzle ORM and Postgres as our database in this project to implement multi-tenancy. So let's go ahead and get started by adding the dependencies we're going to need to support this. So let's go ahead and pnpm install drizzle orm postgres, which is our underlying client we're going to use to connect to postgres using drizzle and that's postgres node. 
Let's also go ahead and install some development dependencies. So we'll use dash D. And we're going to need Drizzle Kit, which is the tool we're going to use to execute our database migration scripts so that the database is always in line with our schema. And one last dependency we also need to install is the at nestjs slash config package. And this is going to allow us to use the .env library to load in environment variables in our project so we don't have to hard code our connection strings to our database. So with these dependencies installed, let's head back to our project where I want to get started by implementing first our multi-tenancy features inside of our Nest.js app. So what I'm going to do is use the Nest CLI again to generate a new module called tenancy. So let's generate this module. And we're also going to want a service for tenancy. So we'll generate service tenancy. And finally, we also want a middleware generated as well. So we can use the Nest CLI for this. So middleware in Nest.js is the same as in ex any Express server. It's going to be a function that we can simply run before each and every request. So in our case, we want to implement multi-tenancy middleware that's going to extract a tenant ID header that a user will be sending to our server on every request that identifies them with a particular tenant. We're then going to use that tenant ID to set context on our application so that for the rest of the request, we're always going to be referencing that tenant ID. So back in our project, we'll firstly see in our app module that we've now imported the tenancy module. And now in tenancy, we have this new tenancy module here as we'd expect. So we're providing this tenancy service. And then we have this empty tenancy service as well as this tenancy middleware, which is already implementing the common interface for middleware in Nest.js, which is this Nest middleware interface, which allows us to implement this one method here called use that gets access to the incoming request, response, and finally the next function which we have to call to let the request proceed. So in here, we're simply just not doing anything other than calling next. So this is essentially empty middleware at the moment. So let's go ahead and change this by implementing our multi-tenancy functionality. So to start off inside of this use function, which is gonna be called before the request actually executes, well, we need to get access to this tenant ID that the user is providing us inside of the header. So the tenant ID header is what's going to identify the user for a particular tenant in our system. So let's go ahead and get access to it. We'll create a const tenant ID and we'll extract the requests.headers and I'll extract the tenant ID. So now that we have this tenant ID, well, there's going to be a couple of things we want to do. Firstly, we want to check to see if this tenant ID is actually valid, meaning it's actually a recognizable tenant inside of our application. Well, in order to do this, we need the ability to register tenants inside of our application at startup, which is going to define all of the tenants and their connection details to their respective database. So let's go ahead and implement this first, the ability to register our tenants at application startup and define the tenants as well as their database connection details. So the first step is going to be to actually define the list of tenants that our application expects. Now to do this, I want to define our tenants inside of a JSON file that our application can read in at startup. So this is a very common pattern to registering tenants in an application as it allows us to essentially define this list in common JSON format, which we can then override when our application is actually running in a production setting. So for example, if our application is deployed to Kubernetes, we can simply override this JSON with the actual real list of tenants and the respective connection details from a Kubernetes config map. So let's go ahead and get started by creating this new tenancy JSON file. So what I'll do is I'll create a tenants.json file directly inside of this tenancy folder. And so in here, we're going to define all of our tenants and their connection address to the underlying database. Well, to do this, of course, we're going to need a database running on our local system so that we can actually test this functionality out. So to do this, I'm going to use Docker to run a Postgres container. And we'll use Docker Compose to actually run this container and manage the orchestration. 
So to do this, well, of course, make sure first that you have Docker installed on your machine, as well as Docker Compose. I have Docker Desktop installed and running here. And then what we're going to do is create a new Docker Compose file at the root of the project, which is going to define the instructions on how to run our containers. So in here, we'll define this services key, which is the list of containers that we're actually going to be running. So we can call this whatever we'd like. I'll call this one Postgres. And now we need to define the underlying image that it's going to be referencing. So in our case, we're going to use the official Postgres image coming from the default Docker Hub repository. Next, we also want to define a list of ports that are going to be exposed on this running container. So in our case, we want to actually forward traffic on our local machine to this Postgres container so that we can connect to the database. To do this, we can provide a port key value pair here where we define the source port and the target port on the container. So this is going to be the local machines port that we can send traffic to. And then that's going to be forwarded to this port on the running container. So in our case, Postgres listens on port 5432. So we'll forward traffic to that on the container and we'll listen for traffic on our local address at the same port. So this way we'll be able to send traffic to localhost 5432 and connect to this Postgres container running inside of Docker. Lastly, we want to define some environment variables for this running container so we can define a new environments key. And I want to define two environment variables. The first will be the Postgres password. So this is the password to connect to the database. I'll use a sample password of just password. And then we want the Postgres DB, which is the default password that Postgres will actually create once this container starts up. So in this case, I'll just call this nest.js multi tenancy. And finally, make sure that this is actually called environment and not environments with an S. So now at this point, our Docker compose file is now complete and we're ready to use the Docker compose CLI to actually run this Postgres container. So I've headed back to the terminal and I've CD'd into the same project directory that we've been working in. And I'm going to use Docker compose up now, which is the command to start all of the services defined in the default Docker Compose YAML file at the root of the project. So now you can see that our Postgres container has started and has outputted some logs here as we've started up using Docker Compose and our database system is now ready to accept connections. So this Postgres container is now running and since we've defined a port forwarding key value pair in our Docker Compose, we can send traffic to this database on localhost 5432, just as this log here states. So with our database now running, let's go back to our tenants.json definition and finish filling out this with some example tenants and their connection details to the underlying database. So I'll go ahead and open up this JSON object and we can call these tenants whatever we want. I want the name of the tenant to be the key. So in our case, I'll just define a sample tenant here, tenant one. And now we want to define the connection string to the database. So of course for Postgres databases, this will be Postgres colon slash slash the username and then the password for the database. So by default, that's Postgres. And then the password we set was password. And now at is going to be host and port. So as we know, that's going to be local host since we're port forwarding traffic on this 5432 port to the running Postgres container. Container. And now lastly, we can provide the name of the database that we're actually connecting to at the end here after a slash. And so we're going to call this database tenant1. So in this example, we're going to define these tenants that are all connecting to the same Postgres container, but they're going to be connecting to separate databases. And in this way, we're going to keep our tenants data completely isolated in completely separate databases and our application will manage the connection management to ensure we're always providing the correct database connection to the correct tenant request. So let's go ahead and add a couple more tenants to this tenants JSON. I'll simply copy and paste the first tenant. And what we can do is now just change the name. So I'll have tenant two, 
and 10 at 3. And so, of course, we know it's the same Postgres container we're connecting to, but now we'll change the name of the database at the end here. So now we have three separate tenants that are connecting to totally different databases where we can keep their data completely isolated. Now that we have those tenants JSON defined, let's go ahead and start utilizing it inside of our tenancy service. So let's go back to our tenancy service and implement some functionality to now read in this tenant JSON file and save the tenants that we find to the service here so we can use them later on. So to do this, we're going to go ahead and implement the nest.js lifecycle hook on module init. So this is a function that nest.js will automatically call on our services when the application is starting up. And so that's when we want to load our tenants into this class. So let's go ahead and create a new tenants const. And we also want to define a type for this tenant inside of TypeScript so we know what it actually looks like. So to do this, I'll create another file inside of tenancy called tenants.interface. And now let's export interface tenants, where of course we know from our JSON, the structure is simply going to be a tenant ID of type string. So this is the key here that we can expect. And then the value, the database connection, is simply another string. So now we have this interface defined, which maps to our tenants JSON. Let's go back here and now define the type for this constant, and that's going to be this new tenants interface that we just defined. So this will be equal to json.parse. So now we're going to parse our tenants JSON file. And to get access to it, we're going to call read file sync from file system and pass in the tenants file path. Now to provide the correct file path when our JavaScript here is going to be compiled and inside of the disk directory, we want to use the join function from path and pass in the dir name constant to get us to the current file. And from here, we know we can simply access the tenants.json file. Now, additionally, we also need to supply a second parameter to this read file sync function, and that's going to be utf. Eight, which is the actual text encoding we're going to apply to the file we're reading in. So now we should be correctly reading in our tenants JSON file. Let's go ahead and start off by just logging this out and see that we can actually see our tenants on application startup. So if we go ahead and check our server logs for our application, we can actually see we have an error being thrown because we're saying there's no such file or directory. And if we look at the file path here, well, we're looking inside of our nest.js multi-tenancy folder, inside of the disk folder where our compiled JavaScript goes. And of course, we don't find the tenants JSON file inside of here. So let's double check this back in the root of our application. I'll refresh and you can see we have the disk folder, which is where nest.js compiles our JavaScript to. So inside of here, if we look inside the, the, the disk folder and inside of tenancy, well, this is actually correct. We don't see this tenants JSON file inside of here in our disk folder. Now, the reason for this is because by default, the nest.js compiler using Webpack is, always, is only going to compile TypeScript code inside of this disk directory. So only our TypeScript files will be copied over to disk and not other file types like on our case, a JSON file. To tell nest.js to copy over json files as well to the disk folder so we have access to it during runtime we need to explicitly tell nest.js about this to do it we can simply go to the nest cli json and modify our compiler options here which is going to allow us to set some certain options for the webpack compiler here we want to now configure this assets option so the assets option is where we can define files or types of files that we want to be copied over to dist when the code is compiled. So in this assets array, we're simply going to go ahead and define a glob to target all JSON files. So we'll do star star slash star dot JSON to look for any JSON files in our project and always copy these over to the dist directory during the compiling process.
So now let's head back to our terminal and restart the development server. And now you can see we've successfully started the application and the tenants that we found from the tenants JSON is being logged, which is excellent. If we go ahead and look at our disk directory now, we can actually see inside of the tenancy folder, we have the tenants JSON that's been copied over. So this is thanks to updating our assets array here in the compiler options to always include the JSON files. So now we're reading in the tenants correctly. Let's go back to the tenancy service and we want to actually make sure that we save these tenants so that we can use them later on during actual requests. So let's create a new private tenants member variable here of type tenants. So we'll set this.tenants equal to tenants. So thanks so much for checking out this preview of the full members only lecture on implementing multi-tenancy in Nest.js with Drizzle. Again, if you want to get access to the full hour plus long lecture, which includes the full integration, which will also provide you access to all of my existing Udemy courses, including the latest highly requested one on building a distributed job manager through Nest.js microservices. I'll leave a link in the description where you can check out my site and get access to all of this content with a membership. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.